But are you ready for the word? Get your Bibles, your notebooks out. We're going to keep teaching. I started on Sunday, and you go, how'd you get over to this? Um, remember that last month was talking about the fruitfulness of God. Amen? How many of you know that God is, has fruitfulness for us? We were looking at our life. We were examining. We were, you know, that, that fruitfulness often comes through some purging and pruning and different things. But Pastor Brad ended on saying what? Keep the lights on. Keep the lights on. Look at somebody say, keep the light on. So what, what happens? The, the enemy wants to advance his agenda by you not keeping the light on. So this month we're teaching on spiritual warfare. How do you actually keep the light on? Because you have to be diligent about this. You have to persevere. You have to be intentional about it. And more than anything, we have to be educated about it. What do I mean? The, the scripture is very clear. We went over a lot of this on Sunday. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. I'm going to do a really quick review. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant, right? Unlearned, ed, uneducated of the wiles or the devices, which means the purpose, the disposition, and the thoughts of the enemy. So we're, we're not ignorant because if we are, we perish, right? We perish because of what? Lack of knowledge. So number one, I actually have seven points tonight. Is that okay? And I've given you four of these already. Number one is you cannot defeat an enemy that you're not aware of. We went through that. There's two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. There's this constant battle going for, over the human race to seek control over that. Point number two, there were 10 principles you must know. If you don't know them, go back and watch Sunday. Is that good? Boy, this is a quick review. Point number three, you ready? Point number three, you have a biblical mandate as a Christian to overcome this evil because evil is something. It is not, or excuse me, evil is someone. It is not something, right? And evil is who? Come on, guys. Old Testament, Satan. New Testament, his name is the devil. You guys are great. Ready? Let's pick up right there. Can we pick up there? Because we're really going to, we left off with point number four. So let's just do a little bit of recapitulation here. Satan has the name that means to oppose or to resist. That's what Satan's name means. He's the one that opposes and resists you. Opposes and resists God's purpose in the earth. Opposes and resists God's people in the earth. God's plan. And so as the people of God, we have to recognize that Satan is the adversary. He is the resister. Now, that's important because sometimes you think it's people stopping you. But how many of you know, no man can stop what God has called your life to be. No man can stop the plan or purpose of God. And sometimes even good people can be used by bad spirits. I would venture to say that even many of us at times have yielded ourselves to a spirit that, that probably we shouldn't have. In a moment, we lost our temper. In a moment, we've said something that we didn't want to. Today, I think we'll get into this deeper and be able to understand how even good people can be used by bad spirits. So we always want to, every single day, pick up our cross and follow Christ. We have to decrease so that he can increase. So the second name is devil. And this one means what? This is so important. It means the accuser and the slander. And this is his greatest function. You only see devil in the, in the New Testament. The main weapon that Satan uses against you daily, and I'm going to pick up here, is that of accusation. And that's really where we left off. I'm not going to review Lucifer because he wasn't always Satan as we know. His name was Lucifer. He was a chief angel. He was beautiful. When he walked down the quarters of heaven, the wind of God would blow. He had pipes that protruded, and this beautiful sound would come out. That's why he hates your praise. Because every time you praise, every time you open your mouth and say, Lord, I glorify you. I bless you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. I love you with all my being. I love you with all my heart. Satan is reminded that he lost his position and will never, ever have it again. That, that, that mere 
man, that mere mortal, come on, that mere piece of dust got his high position to go into the very holy of holies and commune with God. No wonder Satan hates you so much. Your praise is a powerful weapon. We talked about the four things that are the most powerful to overcoming the kingdom of darkness. Number one, the word of God. And this isn't in a specific order. Number two, the name of God. In the name of Jesus, come on, he's given you a name which is above all names number three the blood some of you've got to get old-fashioned sometimes and just I plead the blood sometimes I just start walking around saying the blood the blood the blood I plead the blood in the name of Jesus every time I get in my car I plead the blood of Jesus around this every time we get on a plane I speak to all stor storm turbulence anything that the enemy's got plotted I put the blood of Jesus over this plane right now every time my comings my goings I plead the blood I walk around my house I put a bloodline I told y'all what Papa did what Archbishop did, Archbishop got some oil and he got some, he said, go give me some grape juice. And he got some grape juice. And Twani came around and he started going around speaking in the spirit around our house. And then he, he started putting that grape juice and the oil and he put a line all on our property line. He said, anyone that comes to do destruction, anyone that comes to do harm, any enemy that comes to bring any curse, anything on this house, he said, let them drop right here. He, well, he said, let them drop dead right here in the name. So I was told, if you see dead people in my yard, it is not my fault, I promise you. It is not. But thank you, Papa. I receive it in the name of Jesus. So I just believe that. I really enforce that every day. I get up, walk out the door, take Rocco for a walk, and I say, thank you, angels, for watching over and protecting us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus being over this house. Don't take for granted that blood. It's so powerful. And then when the people would say prayer, and prayer is powerful, but prayer brings the will of God to pass in the earth. Prayer is the vehicle that brings the will of God to pass. So it's a weapon, but your praise is a weapon against the enemy. It's a, it's a, your praise. Remember when Paul and Silas were in the jailhouse and they began to pray and they praised. And as they praised, the bonds came off. So we begin to understand that these spiritual uh, forces of evil who not only have authority, but they, ex they seek to exercise that authority to dominate and to rule. They're persons without bodies. These evil spirits, including the devil, are in opposition to God as people. Um, we looked at two pictures of Satan, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called, dev called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So the Satan can operate, operate like a dragon who is fierce, it's good, and the beast are behave like a snake who is subtle and slippery. He, Jesus gave another picture of Satan in John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And in conclusion, here we go. Steal means to take away that which is rightfully yours, to take your inheritance from you. The devil is a liar. Don't let anyone, come on, don't let any devil take your spiritual inheritance. Fight for your children. Fight for God's promises. Come on, fight for that which belongs to you. Fight for the assignment that God gave you. Come on, fight. You guys got to, y'all got to get a fight spirit. Come on, having done all to stand, stand therefore. That's not like, oh, I'm weak and weary. It's a militant phrase that says, come on. That's your inheritance. To kill refers to this. It refers to Satan's efforts to destroy your life physically, whether it's directly or through sickness, but it also comes from the root of to, to murder, which is the root of bitterness. So watch any bitterness. And then to destroy is the scariest because that is to utterly abolish the purpose of God. And the Greek word is um, A-P-O-L-E-S-E. And it goes beyond time into eternity. It refers to the ultimate ongoing eternal destruction of the lost soul who's been deceived and ensnared by Satan, which brought us to right where we are, all right? So Satan's a life giver. The devil, or excuse me, Satan is a, a life taker. Jesus that was wrong. He is not a life giver. Satan is a life, come on, taker. Jesus is a life giver. He's come to give you life and life more now let's work on that for a minute. Life more abundantly. 
life more abundantly. It means one that is superior in quantity and quality. Quantity and quality. But the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So there are four main tactics. We got to the first one, and I'm going to pick up here. You ready? Say, bring it on, Pastor Paula. Four main, that was pretty good. We did that in seven minutes, guys. I talked fast, but it was seven minutes strong. Ready? Four main tactics that Satan uses against you. I think it's, it's good to review this first one because the first thing that he does is accusation and slander. Now think about this because um, we are not to judge another person. The moment that you begin to judge, you're bringing accusation against them, even at times slander. And the reason for that is because when we do that, we're operating in the nature of the devil. He is the accuser. Now, especially if it's not your position of authority, if, if you're not in a position as a, a, a father, you know, if you're not in a position, there's different positions of authority, right? A pastor, a boss, amen? Y'all are looking at me funny right now. So... What does Satan do? How does this operate? Because Pastor Brad would say stuff often like, Satan lays claim to you. And I'll give you those, those different ways and we could sit here and talk all night. How does Satan actually lay claim? How does the spirit world work? Because if you don't understand this, you can, be the, you can love God with all your being. But you will live less than what God has called you to live here in this earth unless you know how to legally engage in the rights that God has given you through the finished work of Jesus Christ of not just knowing that he finished the work, but being able to appropriate the cross. That is so important that you have the appropriation of the cross and the finished work of Christ Jesus. So... He, he constantly is accusing you, Revelation 12, 10, for the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now, the Greek is K-A-T-E-G-O-R-E-O. -E and it means to be a plaintiff. I'm not gonna ask how many people have been in a lawsuit. Y'all already know I've been in way too many, okay? And I've usually been, usually have been the defendant. And that means somebody has brought some kind of legal action against me. You ought to be shocked at the things that people sue you for. Shocked. I mean, some things you understand, there's accidents that take place or things that happen, and, and rightfully so, you carry insurance because you don't ever want anyone to get hurt on your property. But in Paula White Ministry, I remember one time somebody sued me for using the American flag. And because of our legal system, I had to go through a lawsuit to defend myself for using the American flag for under 30 seconds. Now, of course you win that, but they brought a, are you hearing me? But they still brought a legal claim against me. It was false. It wasn't right. It wasn't accurate. You can play real soft here. It wasn't accurate, but they still brought a legal claim against me. Really soft. None of that hard gospel stuff. I'm just messing with you, X. I'm so messing with them. So, so I want you to get the picture. Satan, the Bible says every single day is bringing legal action against you. Now, I would doubt any of us, even the best of the theologians, understand all the realm of the spirit world. Understand all the realm of things. There are some things like I go, that's stupid to bring a legal claim of, I understand that right away. I understand that right away. But, but the more you grow in God, I would say the more complex those legal claims and complications come against you. Say, so bring it on, Pastor Paul, are you with me? So you get the picture here? He goes and he goes in front of, we talked about some of the things. Let's talk about a few things that he can make claim against you. Number one, the most easy is unrepentive sin. Because anytime there's not repentance in our life, which is an I'm sorry I got caught. It, it, repentance is a true, um, it's not I'm sorry so I can just get over this. It's a true I'm changing my mind, I'm changing my direction. God, help me not do that. Help me not, not be inclined to that. 
Deliver me, Lord. It's a true desire to move away from that which is against God's word. So unrepent of sin, that's, that's the first thing he'd bring to claim. Disobedience. How many of you, God, sometimes gives you simple instructions, just simple things? And God says he would rather us to obey him than to sacrifice. It's the greatest, greatest thing we can do. But disobedience, even in little things. I mean, used to, it was just the obvious instruction. Then I started to remember hearing God's voice pretty well, pretty clear. And he would give me instructions on little things. Like here, I want you to turn right and go stop at the 7-Eleven. Seemed kind of silly. But there would be a divine assignment waiting for me there. Now, obvious things of disobedience are anything in God's word. When you are not obedient to the word of God. So one of the things we talked about, what can he make claim on you? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is if you retain someone else's sins against them, he can retain sins against you. There's a whole lot disunity. I mean, you think it's okay to just go and, you know, pull out of a church or pull out. It's, it's not okay. Not without a lot of consequence. Not without a whole lot of consequence. How many of you would ever just think, and I mean, Demetrius, you're married to the most beautiful person. I'm not sure how that all happened yet. But anyway, can you, can you imagine like if crazy got in your head and you just thought you could not show up at home one night. Tell me how this is going to work out for you. And you're just going to leave. And then two nights or two weeks from now, you're going to go jump in bed with Lulu. How's that going to work out? Crystal's like, Crystal is good. Crystal's like, that ain't going to work out good. No, Crystal's like, honestly, how's that going to work out? He's asking permission from Crystal to speak right now. No, I'm totally kidding. It's not going to work out to, huh? Is Pastor Todd saying, it's not going to work out well, is it? You think she's going to be mad about it? A little bit more? You think your life might be in harm? Crystal's one of those? She going to go cray cray? Okay. Seriously. And, and she could bring, not just, I mean, not with that just emotionally and physically and financially and spiritually and every other way be devastating in all seriousness. But wouldn't you guys think that's pretty crazy? Yeah, I got to do some deeper pastoring here. Y'all are all okay with that? Come up and repent now in the name of Jesus. You guys would think that's absolutely insane. Eli, right? But look what we do all the time. We pull away from the bride of Christ. We pull away. And then we just go to another church. We've joined here under covenant as a member, but part of a body. You've taken on that as covering you and then thinking just go away and go to another church and go away. Now, there's a right way to do it. There is a right way to do it. There's a biblical way. Every decision in your life has consequences. And we just think, oh, we can live any way we want. This is not an American gospel. It's an American, it's not a cultural Christianity. It's a biblical mandate of of everything from beginning to the end of how we are to live. God shows us. So things that we wouldn't even think of like, you know, I told you this, but the number one way we bring curses on ourselves, words. So you cannot speak against yourself. Man, I'm just nothing. I'll never be anything. I hate myself. I wish I were dead. There's one. I wish I was dead. We can't afford that. So what you're doing right there is creating a curse and saying, goes, huh, she can't afford that. She even said so. She's not saying she's the head. She's not saying that she's blessed coming in and blessed going out. She's not saying that you are her supplier and you'll bring all supply and provision to her. She's not saying that you've given her everything pertaining to life and godliness that she needs according to your virtue, the covenant of God that was sealed by the blood of Jesus. She's not saying you're her Jehovah Jireh. She's saying, I can't afford that. She's just saying, I'm poor. (laughs) She's poor, God. And God's going, I want to bless you. But you're going, I'm poor. 
So Satan can use that accusation against you at all times. You might can say something like, you know what, in the natural right now, I don't have a lot of substance, but in Christ, I am rich. And I know that I've been young, now I'm old, and according, maybe I'm not old, but according to the psalmist, my God has never forsaken the righteous. So I'm not going to be the first to mess up his reputation. So you can say today, you can go like this. People are going, how are you doing? I'm dying. You could have cancer. You might have diabetes. You might have something that's not a, a good health report. But the moment you say, I'm dying, you've pronounced your sentence. Now, God has broken the covenant with death, hell, and the grave. Are you all with me tonight? Are we all guilty in somewhere? Of course we are. Come on. The moment you go, I'm dying. I'm dying. Then saying, she's dying. He's dying. And, and you can say all day long, well, you know, I just want to be healed. He's a healer. He's your deliverer. He bore stripes on his back that he should not have received under the Roman law. He should not have been crucified and whipped and beaten, but he did that so that you would be healed in the name of Jesus. He did that so Louise would be cancer-free. He did that so Deacon Chris would not go under a surgery. He did that so you could have life and life more abundantly. He is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. So Satan has bases now because we've, we've made these. So watch, watch how powerful the mouth is. Most of us, when we start in salvation, most of us, start with a place like Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Now, I believe in much more than a confessional model because I think you can confess and not have something in your heart. I think you can have something in your heart and not necessarily confess. Okay, that's deeper. Because, but, but most of us, Demetrius, like we, we were having theological debates about this. Oh, don't get me going there. X, help these youngins. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. It all works out, guys. But most of us think Romans 10, 9, and 10, right? You're like, what's that? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and was raised from the dead. It's a very important part. Was raised from the dead. You shall be saved. Are y'all all good on that? So how many of you believe that um, it's a good thing, it's a God thing, that part of your salvation is making a confession, a covenant with your mouth? So the word confess means covenant. So every time you speak a word out, you're making covenant. Every time you release a word, you're making covenant. So how many of you think that when you release a word and you make covenant and you receive Jesus Christ, that's a, that's a big part of your salvation, right? And you need to get baptized. How many of you believe that's a big part? It's a huge part. Now, why do you believe that that confession, what came out of your mouth, is so strong that it unites you with an almighty God, but what you say against the word of God does not unite you with Satan? Of course it does. That's why the Bible says bitter waters and sweet waters cannot flow out of the same fountain. It's too quiet in this Presbyterian church right now. I'm trying to help you get, get, get. So, so we see that, that words are one of the main vehicles. The sins of our forefathers. Maybe you have didn't do something. You keep going, well, why does every time I get a job, I lose a job? Why is every time I, I go to buy a house or have ownership or property, something falls, falls through? Why is there barrenness in my life? Why can't I get pregnant? Why is there suicide? There are some things that you had absolutely nothing to do with, but until someone takes action to replace, revoke, and remove, I used to say rebuke, you know, until you deal with that, those have legal rights to keep going. Now, here's the good news. Generational blessings go to 10 generations. Generational curses go to three to four generations. That's mercy. Thank goodness for mercy and goodness. Rebellion. And we tend to think of rebellion. Well, I'm not. The one thing that made us all um, against God, it says all of us are sinners. Would you agree with that? The Bible says that. 
Well, we haven't all done the same thing. Not everybody's murdered. Not everybody stole a cookie out of the jar. Not everybody slept around. Not everybody cussed. Not everybody broke the law, ran a stoplight. But the one thing we've all done, <laughs> the one thing we've all done, according to Isaiah, is we all have been a rebel to God. Every single one of us. And so we can say witchcraft is the sin of rebellion, but, but there's little things that are rebellion. I, and I shouldn't say they're little things because they're big. How many of you would be honest, and I'll be the first to say, there have been times in my life I've had fear. Anybody else had fear? Worry, anxiety, stress, preoccupation, rumination, fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is peace, Jesus, it's to trust. So the opposite, without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God, be in agreement with God. So the just shall what? Live by faith. So the moment that I get in fear, worry, preoccupation, stress, anxiety, the moment I get there, I'm in direct opposition of faith, of trust. God doesn't say, trust me with, like what's something easy? I can trust God with finances easily. I, it just is an easy thing for me to trust God. But what if, um, okay, relationships harder for me to trust God because of my background, my past. So what if I go, well, I trust you with, re with, with finances, but man, I don't know. Right now, I, I don't, I'm looking at everybody suspicious. No, God doesn't say you can trust me with one thing, but not another thing. We all have different propensities. So now you're in fear in some area. And if you stay in fear and don't deal with that, fear becomes doubt. The moment you stay in doubt, you get a disposition of unbelief, and that's rebellion towards God. Rebellion towards God. What are some other things? Unfulfilled vows. And you make promises to do something, and you, you don't do it. Idolatry. We talked about anti-Semitism. Um, things like perjury, robbing God, not bringing God what belongs to him. Offerings, tithe, etc. cetera. Uh, th th it, I could go on and on. You're a steward, you're a manager. So anytime you think you own something, you're giving the enemy, you're giving the enemy legal rights. Some of you think that you own that spouse. <laughs> Some of you think you own your children. Some of you think you own your possessions. Some of you think you own your time. News. The Bible says you are owner over nothing. You are steward. You've been called into fellowship with God. You're not a slave any longer. You're a son of God. You're a partner with God. You're in fellowship with God. But we don't own anything. We steward everything. So the moment that I make something mine and I go, so my ex said this about me on TV and it was public. He said, I made her. I created her. That didn't turn out too good for him. He publicly made that statement. And he believed. Now, he had a large part in my development. He had a large part that he played in, in the development of God in me. But nobody owns me. I love you guys, but you don't own me. I love my husband, but he doesn't own me. I love my children. They don't own me. There's only one owner of my life. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. You don't own anything in life. You don't own a person. Don't live this disillusionment. See, there's so many ways. You want me to keep going? I can think of a thousand other ways that Satan can get in and make legal accusation against you. So he's up before right now. Get a picture of it. He stands before the Father every day, makes accusation against you, accusation against you, accusation against you. And I would be sure to say there's somewhere in all of our lives that he can find a legal right for accusation. So I, at the end, I said, this is how I pray every day. And, and I just ask God. I come before the Lord not even thinking. I'm like, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and I told you, hallowed be thy name. I praise you. I glorify you. I thank you for the goodness of God. Thank you for this day. I ask for you to forgive me for all my sin, knowingly and unknowingly. Search my heart. Anything unrepentant. I cover myself by the blood of Jesus on the basis of the finished work of Jesus cross, Christ. The blood that was shed on the cross, that it was buried in a borrowed tomb, that he rose again on the third day with resurrection power. I place my 
yourself under the finished work of Jesus Christ, and I call myself exonerated. I thank you that I am free. I am free from sin. I am free from guilt. I am free from shame. And I just start going, and then I start praying. But every day, because I don't think like there's a 24-hour period that probably Satan couldn't get some kind of advantage over us. So every day we're applying and appropriating. That's not works, that's smart. That's just not being lazy. That's just saying, God, I place myself at, at your, in your hands, at your feet. And so what Satan does, he doesn't only bring accusation to God against us, but he also brings it to us. You're not good enough. You won't make it. He has this great way of pointing out all of your bad points, all the weaknesses in your life. And so he, he makes you feel like guilty or worthless or shameful. And that's important for where we're going to go a little bit later. The second thing, and I didn't get to it, but here we go. So the number one tactic he uses is accusation. And I stayed there for a while. So when we say Satan makes a claim against you, you'll understand now, right? He's being the plaintiff. There is literally a courtroom of heaven, quarters of heaven. Now he's going to get the final judgment and the final judgment is going to be made against him. And we win in the name of Jesus. We win in the name of Jesus. But I need to be exonerated on the basis of the blood. Number two, how many of you would, you have promises that you are not seeing fulfilled and you know it's not God being bad. Come on, you know God is a good God. There's always a reason, and that's why we're studying this. We're taking the word, applying the word. How's the enemy work? The second thing he uses is deception. Revelation 12, 9, who deceives the whole world. One day we're going to stand and say, this is the worm who deceived the whole world? Paul said that the whole entire region of Galatia was deceived. Now, don't ever think that you can't be deceived. If he has the ability to deceive the entire world and regions, he's pretty good at what he does. Don't underestimate the enemy. He's not God's enemy. He's not. He's your enemy. God's already defeated. God struck him down. The minute he tried to take over, God dealt with it. If you wanted to get to me, I better watch out because I, I, I like there are some things that I'm still letting, letting the Lord work out. John, I think he can pretty much take care of himself, but, you know, I'll fight for him. But he, he's, he's a strong man. My kids, you know, Brad's going to always be my baby. He's my 37-year-old baby. They're my baby. Y'all mamas know what I'm talking about. They have, like, beards growing and stuff. They're like, my baby, come here. And woo go 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 It's like, oh, mom, God, get away. <laughs> so... That's just a mama, right? But you know what? Brad can pretty much fight for himself. I might take up for Rachel a little bit. <laughs> but now, Asher and Nick, y'all don't even try. Don't even try. It's on all day long. They're just innocent. Todd, how many do you have? Ten now? Ten grandchildren. Don't even try, right? You got a little baby because they they can't fight for themselves so much right you with me on this so I'm saying that when we say he deceives the whole world Jesus explains Satan does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him it says um whatever whenever he speaks a lie he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies John 8 44 because Satan is a liar, he does not come to us with truth. He never presents facts. He just leads you to believe certain things. And if we can be persuaded to believe something that is contrary to Scripture, we know somehow between, behind that persuasion, think what I'm saying, behind that persuasion, if you can be persuaded, guys, I, I hate to even say this, I've been persuaded how do I say this? Obviously, you can look at my life and see that early on, I wrote about it in something greater. Early on, I, I made some massive failures in my life, not because I was a bad person, not because um, 
I didn't love God. It wasn't. It was because the enemy came after me and I didn't know it was the enemy. I got prideful. I thought I was really doing something that nobody else was doing. 21 years old, oh, look at this. Y'all must not be doing anything. If God's just growing this youth group like that, that's pride. Thought I was doing something. And next thing I knew, I write about it in something greater. Uh, there, was a, there, was, there was sin in my life. There was sexual sin in my life. So it was really hard for me later when I got accused of things when I'm in my 40s and 50s because I wasn't doing anything in my 40s and 50s. I can't say I never did anything in my life wrong. But I, you, you grow and you get things better. So I felt like I was getting slapped for having my hand in a cookie jar that wasn't in that cookie jar. And part of me felt, well, maybe I should get slapped because I had my hand in a cookie jar that nobody knew about 30 years ago. Why y'all looking at me like your hand's never been in a cookie jar? See, all of you that are judging right now, the enemy's working at you because he's the, he's the slander. He's the one that's accusing you. Like, I knew it all along. I wrote about it in a book. I wrote it all, guys. But watch what I'm saying. Because the enemy will use something and persuade you, you can have a better life. You deserve to be treated better. You deserve to be loved on. You deserve to be made to feel good. You deserve to be provided for. He doesn't even come home on time. Why are y'all looking at me like nobody else has ever sinned? He deserves, see the enemy just doesn't come. He, he persuades you. You shouldn't stay there. You can go to any place you want. You can work any place you want. You can go to any church. They're all the same. He persuades you. He persuades you to do things that feel good to your flesh. He persuades you to believe something that's contrary to the word of God. Let, let me tell you something. God told us to pastor. He called us to start a church. We, we had no money. We had no salary for two years. And this man came, I told you this, with this contract. And it was a contract. He worked for the Miss USA pageant. And it was a contract with Universal Studios and Miss USA pageants that would have put us in all 50 states. And we would be going on a Thursday through a Sunday and be able to fly home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I said, well, maybe God didn't call us to pastor and God had clearly called us to pastor. I said, you know, we're still doing the work of the Lord. And look, the, the world is paying for it. The enemy's paying for it. We'll just stay and evangelize because we'd be done at one o'clock on Sundays or something like that. I said, we'll stay in that city. They'll pay for our hotel. They'll pay for our travel. And we'll just preach on Sunday night and be able to do evangelistic. He was, it was persuading. And God had clearly, after a 21-day fast, called Pastor Randy and I to pastor. And I'm trying to justify, like, this is what we're going to do. Now, I had a very clear word because God will give you a clear word on things, amen? And I remember the contract, it paid him, I don't even know how many thousands, it was, it was a lot of money, several thousands of dollars a week. It felt like it was, that had to be God. And I remember when we turned the man down, we went to him, his name was Emory Smith. We went to Emory and we said, we can't take this. And so we came back home and the contract was still laying there. You know what I did? I ripped the, con bless you, I ripped the contract up because it was so tempting for me to go back to that. You see, the enemy did it to Eve. The enemy's done it to so many people. He'll always persuade you out of the will of God, persuade you out of the word of God. Y'all are looking like you're saved, so I don't need to teach you this, all right? He twists your mind against scriptural beliefs and introduces deception to us. And the only real safeguard against that is the Word of God, staying in the presence of God, staying fresh with the Holy Spirit, being led by, but it's always the Word of God. God, what do you have to say? You've got to know this Word. You've got to be strong in this Word. The third thing that the enemy does is temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God. Command these stones that they might become bread. So the word tempt means to entice. He entices you. 
Satan entices us to do evil. He places something before us that is wrong, that is evil, and he presents it as desirable and as attractive. He tempts you. So think of all the stuff that was working with that contract. A temptation, deception. You can do it the way you want to do it. You, you can do it with the whole world system and justify it's God's calling. God was calling us to a completely separated life, a life that was dedicated to him. And the truth of it was, is we were kind of scared to walk away from just what was, you know, pretty stable provision and trust God with what he'd called us to. So Satan, once we become convinced it's desirable and attractive, Satan says, if you want this, then here's what you need to do. And that what you need to do will always be disobedience against God's word. Always. Number four, the tactic that the enemy uses is hindrance. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 18. We wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Now think about what he's saying. You know what the word there means? It means to impede the progress. Now this is important because it, it literally is a Greek word that means that it's like taking a, a fork, you know, one of those jack forks and breaking up the road so that you can't go across clearly. So one of the things you've got to know is Satan doesn't just accuse you, right? He doesn't just deceive you. He doesn't just tempt you, but he hinders you. So God says, when, when people get hindered, a lot of times they'll just fall back. All right, y'all are all Bible scholars, so I should just stop and pray right now. But let me tell you how bad this is. In the wilderness, when, when Joshua was called to take the people over to Israel, he, he, his name was Jesus. Moses was to take him over, right? Joshua is Jesus, just like Jesus was taking you over into the promised land of God's covenant. So Joshua or Moses was to have an 11-day journey. But the people got out in the wilderness. They got to a place that was uncomfortable for them. And what they start doing? Thank you. What they start doing? Murmuring. What's murmuring? They start complaining. How many of you have ever complained? How many of you have ever complained as a Christian? <laughs> Extra high. I got to rebuke that. Everybody close enough knows that. I got to rebuke that complaining spirit. You, you know what I'm doing right there? You ready? Provocation, provoking God. I'm provoking God in my wilderness. Now, Satan's doing a good job because what he's doing is he's putting a hindrance in front of me. Now, I'm seeing what I'm saying. I, I, I have, here's the promise of God. You're going to shake nations in between. There's, there's over 100 million views of me praying something. In between, there's a trending on Twitter. In between, there are friends that walk away. In between, there's people that said, you turned your back on a certain type of church. In between, there are people that, that drop out and don't partner anymore. Hindrances. In between, the finances nosedive. So in between here and that one assignment are a whole bunch of hindrances, impediments, impediments to get over into the place of promise. Though God had said, this is where you go. This is assignment. This is what you do. I promise you in your purpose, there's going to be impediment. If you have no impediment, I'm confused if you're even walking in purpose. I'm confused if you're even, there's going to be delays. There's going to be people that turn on you. There's going to be all kinds of stuff because Satan, if he can't deceive you and he can't get you in complete accusation and he can't tempt you and we've all failed in those, but I'm about to show you how we win the victory anyhow. Thank you, Jesus. We've all failed. We've all failed in them, but he's always going to have hindrances because I promise you, it's not a straight line. You're going to get in a boat. Jesus is going to say, go to the other side. You're going to get the instruction. Okay, cool. Get in the boat. And in the middle of that going to the other side, a storm that you didn't know about, your husband's going to walk out on you. Your kid's going to overdose. Something's going to happen that you never thought. You're going to get a report that, that your body's full of cancer. You're going to be fired from your job. You're going to come down with something. 
something. A storm that you didn't know about is going to rise in the middle of your assignment to go to the other side. It's literally called a lilacs. That lilacs is a type of storm that means that it's not just a, a, a few winds and wave blowing. It means it comes from an earthquake. It comes from something that is foundational, that is rocking the very foundation. Things that you would never see come. You find out that your spouse was having an affair. You find out, come on, that, that your best friend just robbed all your account and took everything. I know you guys don't go through ordinary life or nothing else happens. You tiptoe through tulips. But when the children of Israel got out in the middle, they looked and said, oh my gosh, here's a Red Sea. We didn't know you were bringing us to graveyards like this. You brought us out to bury us. You brought us out to destroy. We were better in Egypt eating garlic and, and leeks and onions because you brought us out not to get to a place of promise, but there's an impossible hindrance. And because I can't see a way over this financial mountain, I can't see a way over this health mountain, I can't see a way over this family mountain, I can't see a way over this spiritual mountain, I can't see a way. It was better back in Egypt. You brought me out here to die. And Moses was the epitome of God wrapped up to the children of Israel. And the reality is we hit hindrances all the time. And when we hit those hindrances, we end up usually provoking God. And the Bible says that there are two types of people, those that draw near and those that draw back. And he says, don't be like the children of perdition that drew back. Don't be when Satan puts that hindrance, that obstruction, when everybody's left you, when everything's gone wrong, when you hit that season, when your family's not there for you, when your pastor's not there for you, when your friends are not there for you, when things can happen on your timeline, where it's not the comfortable place of your life or the mountaintop, but it's a deep, dark valley that you're walking through. It's nothing left but ashes. When you are there, recognize that Satan is doing his job because something on the inside of you has a determination that you're going to keep going, keep pressing. Listen, I always say it. They don't go after the guy sitting on the bench. They go after the one that's holding the football. They don't throw stones at dead birds. Listen, they don't go after the person that's not doing anything. The fact that you're moving, the fact that you're going in the place, the fact that you decide, I'm going to fulfill God's will. I'm going to fulfill the purpose. I'm going to do, I'm going to outlast you, devil. I'm going to outstay you. I'm going to praise you in this place of pause. I'm going to be in this season of frustration with a praise on my lip. I'm going to confuse you even though it hasn't worked out the way I thought it should. I'm going to keep going. Guys, if I would have done what my flesh wanted me to do, I would have been out of a popka. I would have been out of everywhere, guys. I would have been out of every sin. Not because I don't love you. Not because, because this never made sense to me in the first place. I would be out of every role that I fulfilled in the first. I'd be like, oh, that one hurt. You think I would have stayed up in the White House serving? I'd have been like, oh, I just was doing a visitation. Check. See you guys later. You think I'd stay pastoring? Pastoring is hard. Pastoring's hard. It's hard. And you're making a lifetime commitment to people. It's hard. You'd been out of your thing too. He's good at putting those hindrances, isn't he? I feel like I'm not going to get any further. I want to get into principalities, powers, all that other, but I need to deal with this right now because there's some hindrances. I need to just deal. I need to stay right here. And so when, when you hit that place, he's literally got the jackhammer and he's hammered up your road and you're hitting it. And you're like, I don't, and then you just feel, have you ever run, think of yourself running into brick wall. Think of yourself driving 60 mile per hour, 80 mile per hour for some of y'all in that nice car that you're going in and all of a sudden you just hit a brick wall. You don't feel comatose if not dead. You're not gonna be able to walk right. Well, spiritually, you were just, everything was flowing and you don't even know it's just one day you feel dead inside. One day you just feel numb. One day you just like, am I even saved? Because the presence of God doesn't feel like it's here. And it's not, it's a hindrance. Hear what I'm saying? You just hit the wall 60 mile per hour. You're like, what happened? Just exactly what's supposed to happen. Satan's trying to stop you at every single way that he can stop you. 
and you were running, running, running. He's like, oh my gosh, they're running. That one's dangerous. You, you got to keep at least crawling. Get out of the car and crawl. In other words, you got to say, everybody waited on Moses and, and, and it got worse. Listen, listen to me. It got worse. How many of you guys know that there's some triggers in your life? There's some things that just tr get you going. Guess what happened? It, it, it would have been bad just to be there at a Red Sea, right? That's, that's bad because there's no way over and you're supposed to go possessed. But, but now this is really bad because you're looking and you're looking at this guy that led you out to this promised land, but now you hear this. Now that doesn't bother any of you because you weren't slaves in Egypt because you didn't hear the chariots of Pharaoh. But if you were the slaves in Egypt and you knew what, you just took their silver, you just took their gold, you just took their remnant, you, you, you just left, you just came out and you didn't just come out, but you came out with all their stuff. See, you know it. Because if you've ever been abused in life, if you've ever been misused in life, if you've ever been hurt, you get scared at a shadow. You'll get like, because if you just smell something that smells like that abuser, if you just hear something that hears like that abuser, your whole body will tense up. Everything in you will go into fight or flight. Everything in you will go into a trauma mode immediately. Not only do I have an impossible situation, now is this impossible? You don't think God knew there was a Red Sea? I promise you, your purpose and your call has a Red Sea somewhere in it. I promise you. You. and there's going to be a Pharaoh's army behind you and now you've got it behind you you've got it in front of you and, and you're traumatized because you're being triggered because you don't even have to see Pharaoh you can hear the sound of the chariots the Bible said that they heard they knew they were coming it wasn't just something they were imagining so can you imagine their blood pressures going up can you imagine have you ever been under extreme stress you thought somebody was about to hurt you harm you for those who've been traumatized those of you who've been through some stuff like myself, you know what happens to you physically, emotionally, mentally. And God says in the book of Hebrews, which means to cross over. Listen, when you're in those positions, Hebrews means to cross over. That's what it is. He said, when, when you're in that position, there's some of you that Satan knows exactly what to do. Just impede your progress. Just, just, I'm not talking about the stupid things they teach you in Christianity nowadays. That God is all about you getting your favorite parking spot. Show it to me in the Bible. I don't see anywhere where God promises me a good parking spot. I don't care if I've got to park five lots away. This is not some little game about me getting able to park next to Macy's or J.C. Penney's or Neiman Marcus. This is about a real devil who wants to steal, who wants to kill, and who wants to destroy. And he will put some things that will impede my progress that it looks like I can't get over which my heart is beating for because I'm afraid of my past I'm afraid of the enemy that's chasing me down I'm afraid of going back I'm afraid of what they're going to do for me and he puts the sound the smell the sight of everything that I tried to run from right behind me and my heart's beating like this and my blood pressure's up and I'm about to explode a vessel or two because I'm scared out of my wit and scared out of my mind and on top of it you're probably leading somebody you're leading a family you're leading some kids you got something that you got to get over to the other side and there's impediment in you come on this is what I'm talking about that Satan is good at what he does and he's a he's a liar come on he's a liar and God says cross over cross over cross over cross over cross over and he reminds us throughout the entire book of Hebrews he says there are those that will pull back he said, when you pull back, and he uses some harsh words in the Greek. He basically says, you pull yourself into perdition. That's some serious language there. And he said, there are those that will come forth and they'll draw nigh. You're drawing nigh. I believe that you don't know how deep that is. You don't know if that Red Sea is two feet or 2,000 feet. You don't know if those waves, you know, 
The movies make it look so good. Oh, Charlton Heston. Your red, red Sea does not look like Charlton Heston. First off, you don't got nobody that good looking leading you. Just messing with you. It, it's not that perfect. It's scary. It's tiring. You can be sick for a day, be sick for two years. You can be broke for a month, be broke for three years. You can go to a, a tumultuous home for a year or two, go through it for five years, keep believing. Satan just keeps putting those hindrances. You know what God keeps saying? Draw nigh, draw nigh. Now this takes strong Christianity because you thought the hindrance was the easy one. Oh, tch. this isn't about getting your favorite parking spot. It's about standing firm un under pressure. It's about an endurance that you have to have. Don't feel it. You just do it. You do it because God says. You do it because even though Pharaoh's breathing down your neck and there's a Red Sea, you know that God's faithful. If you drown in it, he's got to resurrect you. You, you just, God, I can't drown in this. If I do, it's on you. I live that kind of world and relationship with God. I really do. If I drown God, this one's on you. But I'm going to put my foot in front of the other and I'm going to start walking. And I'm going to walk when it hurts. I'm going to walk when it's hard. I'm going to walk when I don't feel like it. I'm going to walk sometimes even with a bad attitude. I'm going to ask you to forgive me for the bad attitude when I'm walking and I'm still going to probably have it and have to work it out. Because life's not just this easy little thing. Because here's the danger. When you get across that Red Sea, well, that's really just the beginning. I hope that you don't just mumble and complain in the wilderness the whole time and the whole generation has to die off. But when you get across that hindrance, you start catching your breath, you get energized, you get good again, only for another battle ahead of you. Every time you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And here's what it's all about. And this would be my next point and my last point. Ready? After hindrance, I would have taught you both the kingdom of God and saints hierarchy, but I'll do all that later. I didn't get nearly where I wanted to. Here's what it is all about. If I can find my point, I'll just say it. That the victory that Jesus won over Satan, here, here's, the, here's the point. The point is, is that you are already victorious. That's the point. That is the point that the victory was already procured. Colossians 2, 14 through 15, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made it a public spectacle, triumphing over them at the cross. So the scripture describes God the Father, what he did through his son, Jesus Christ. That, that Jesus disarmed all of Satan's forces. Jesus disarmed all of Satan's forces, stripping them of their weapons and defeating them. The victory over Satan is not waiting to be won. It was already won. So you say, well, why am I going through the battle? Why am I being hindered? Why am I being tempted? Why am I being deceived? Why am I being accused? Because Satan has to do his job to get you in a place that he can absolutely annihilate you, if not destroy you. Absolutely stop you from fulfilling the plan, the purpose, the calling, and walking in the goodness of God. But I say to you that this, the devil is a liar. Because the, the only thing that Satan can really do is obscure from you the work of the cross. You aren't hearing what I'm saying. He can only obscure from you what was already done through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That, that when Jesus Christ raised from the dead, he gave you all authority, all power, both in heaven and in earth. Now, that doesn't mean the battle is going to go away. It means that if you can make it through the small battle, Satan's going to go, uh-oh, this is a real force to deal with. 
You start lasting as long as Todd and I are lasting, excuse me, Pastor Todd and I are lasting, that's very dangerous. You, you start getting around it's like where, where you're putting 75, 80 years of ministry between the two of us, that's a dangerous situation. You start getting around people. I told you I, I preached, um, they put a classic Paula up, and I would say this, Vicki, and everyone that knows how I, I preach and hoop and everything else, say, I don't even trust you if you don't walk with the limp. Talk to me, Jacob. If your life was too per perfect, I'm looking at you going, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? Because anyone I know has certainly gone through battles with the devil. And if you're really going to be an Israel, one that prevails with God and man, it wasn't until he wrestled with God and God touched him in the seat of his own strength. He touched him in his hip. That's a place of your, your strength in your whole body. And then he walked with the limp. I wouldn't trust anybody that don't walk with the limp. And the problem with our society, they like everything that looks good. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. They, they don't like to know that you fell down. I want to know if you haven't fallen down, then you're not ready for stripes. You're not ready for the stars. You're not ready for the promotion. If you haven't gone knocked down at least a few times, if you haven't just fallen down and been able to get back up. I can't trust you to go out there and be on more. I've got to take you back to training. I'm hoping you can do this. I'm trying to get the intelligence in you. I'm trying to equip you, but I won't know till you get out on the battlefield if everything that you learned in training is going to work for you. And if it doesn't, I'm going to put some people around you to help you out there on the battlefield. So when you get discouraged because of the hindrance, when you want to move back because of the trigger, when you want to freeze because there's a Red Sea in front of you. I'm going to put some people out on the battlefield with you that are going to help you cross over, help you make it, to say, this is what I've been through. I did mess up, but God still gave me a worldwide ministry. God still covered me with his grace. God still said, Paula, I love you, and I haven't given up on you. Just because I wasn't perfect, just because I started in a place and have a past that doesn't look like it's ministry material, doesn't mean that God disqualified me, doesn't mean that God disqualified qualifies you. Doesn't mean that God doesn't have something great for you. Just because I had a bad day last week, come on, just because I had a bad day, it wasn't 20 years ago, doesn't mean God said, you're done with Paula. But to whom much is given, much is required. I can tell you now, God requires more out of this 56-year-old who still messes up, come on, who still, but not intentionally. I wouldn't do anything to ever hurt God or hurt a person. There'd be nothing inside of me, but God requires more of me as a 56 year old than when I was that young 18 year old girl or 21 year old girl a 30 year old girl come on our 40 year old girl because we're supposed to be going from glory to glory to glory to glory uh, someone called me this week and I was at, and this person's in a very high position over a lot of people and I was able to help them through some things I said I went through 20 something years of that they're like I've never met anyone in my life who's gone through the stuff you've gone through and I won't even start naming it but I could speak peace and strategy into a situation.